So basically, uh, for, for all of you in the audience, what we wanted to do this year, obviously the Monktoberfest has always been about trying to bring together craft beer and trying to bring together tech. So we've always had the beer, you know, apart from some cameos from brewers at the event, however, we've never actually had them incorporated into the agenda itself. So we have a, a spread of uh, individuals here, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves briefly. What do you do and what do you do in beer? So Greg, we can start with you. Uh, my name is Greg Norton. Um, I am the owner of Beer Cellar, which is a, um, we call it an artisanal bottle shop here in Portland. We sell uh, craft beer, wine, uh, cider, and mead, but definitely our focus is, uh, is beer. It's probably about 90% of what we do. Um, we've been in business for about 15 months now, um, and basically our focus is trying to educate our customers and uh, bring in constantly shifting new beers every, we try to rotate about 75% of our stock every two weeks, so there's always something uh, new and interesting. What's going on everybody? I'm Josh Wolf from Allagash Brewing Company. Um, I've done a bunch of different things at the brewery. My current capacity right now is I'm, I'm a sales rep and I cover the state of Maine, but actually started in our warehouse. I worked in production a little bit, um, worked on the bottling line, and then in our office. So seen a lot of different angles from the brewery, a lot of different facets, and uh, just thanks for having me today. Hello, my name is Jim Conroy. I'm the brewer at The Alchemist in Waterbury, Vermont. <clears throat> cheers, cheers. Uh, we're trying to bring uh, craft quality to a production uh, facility, which is putting our beers in cans, uh, making small quantities at a time, and doing the best that we can and making solid beer for everybody to drink in New England and beyond someday. But uh, pretty much we're in Waterbury, uh, Vermont, and we're not too far out of that. So even for guys in Maine, this is uh, a tough get, which is really cool. So cheers, cheers, drink up. Hi, I'm Brian um, from Stillwater Artisanal. <clears throat> um, I guess my, my project's a little bit different than most other breweries. Um, I got this Gypsy Brewer label that I, 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 didn't, re I didn't really ask for. But <laughs> um, so, I, I mean, after listening to some of the talks, uh, I was here earlier um, about upstarts is kind of reminded me a lot of the the project you know I was just like dabbling for about six years at home just making beer and um, and I kind of met another guy <coughs> named named Brian who um, were about the same age and and uh, he was starting an import company he was tired of his job and thought that the beer I was making at home was better than the stuff he was importing so um, offered to kind of assist if I wanted to go professional, um, which was a goal, but I didn't have the money to um, start a brewery. So we, uh, I, I took the elements from what we all had between the skill sets of myself as a, as a brewer and a craftsman or, and such, and, uh, and all the, <clears throat> the distribution outlets and the business sensibilities that he had and kind of mashed it together and formed this thing called Stillwater. So, um, yeah, it's good to be here. <laughs> I enjoy it. All right, so uh, I'll open up to questions from you guys. So I know actually Neil had a question about the, the business mechanics earlier. We'll get to you in just a second. Um, I'm actually curious, one of the things that um, I don't know if you guys you know, from the craft beer world are aware of, this is really pretty unusual for tech to get a whole bunch of people on the stage who, at least in the, in the case of the brewers, are sort of nominally competitors. This doesn't happen. Right, you know, tech is not, you know, sort of for lack of a better term, terribly friendly, you know, to competition. Usually, it's you know, what can we do to wipe out competition and so on. So, one of the things I've always appreciated about the craft beer sort of world is that you guys actually work really well together. You try to help each other out. You'll appear at each other's events and so on. So, I'm curious for any of you, you know, how is that? You know, how did that come to be? I mean, is that something that you picked up from other breweries? Is that something that you just enjoy yourself? I, Brian. I, I think it's changing. <clears throat> I think it was more. It was more so. Um, I think not. Not in every way. I mean, I think it's still a friendly community. But um, the craft beer scene was a big boom when I go, going from like when you know majority of the beer market is um, is you know the major labels you know like Budweiser and such. Um, but <clears throat> this recent boom of an intense amount of new breweries popping up. Um, I think it's going to make a more competitive um, landscape for craft beer. 
Um, <laughs> I mean, but it's like anything. I mean, a growing, growing, a growing business, and you know, concept like that is, you know, eventually is, you know, com competition's good. You know, it keeps people on their toes and yeah, keeps yeah. people like making things fresh and progressing. I mean, and much like the tech industry, that's that's that you know that that's how I, I would equate it. Is, you know, we we don't <clears throat> you know how are we just going to keep making you know just the old standard beers and stuff and like this is this now I think this while it's going to bring a, a bit of you know competition it's not going to be the most at times it's not going to be the most friendly as atmosphere it is going to bring new concepts and ideas into the world of what we're doing. Josh, Jim, any of you guys have? Um, yeah, I'd love to add to that. Uh, for us, um, can everyone hear me out there if I don't have the mic up too much? Great, great. Um, the world of beer is huge and immense all over the world. And we have such a small corner of that that the market is so wide open for all of us. Um, I think for all of us who are doing something special and doing great, we're so far from reaching a, a cap of that in our product and our ability to make that product and the, um, the ingredients that we have to make that product are in such uh, limited capacity um, sometimes that I think we're really far away from pushing the envelope of not being able to be together like that. I think um, we, there's a ton of space in the market and competing, like you said, only makes us better and it's barely competing because there's so much market that we have yet to tap that, you know, we're barely known out of Vermont, you know. Um, people come to us every day from Massachusetts and have never had the beer, you know, and that's three hours away. So we have a lot of... <laughs> you, sir. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of space, a lot of space to grow with that kind of... Um, and, I'm not, and Allagash does it absolutely amazing, and they're a... a amazing company that has been doing this for a, you know a real long time and um, market share is a fascinating subject yeah yeah I think um, Stephen kind of you know collaboration historically in craft beer has been something that's been great I know when I mean, Maine Beer Company and Rising Tide were right in our neighborhood you know if they needed um, you know some grain or whatever right down the street we'd be able to help them out and we're happy to do that so I think in I, I think in the macro sense, uh, Brian's definitely right. With all these new breweries and all this capacity coming online, it's going to become more competitive, and people are probably going to close in a little bit. But I think in like uh, locally, people will still help each other out a lot. And in general, as compared to tech and a lot of other businesses out there that are very cutthroat, it's 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 a lot of um, there there is um, you know a, a lot of collaboration. Uh, I think it's, it's Definitely, I want away from stopping that collaboration, especially because it's a lot easier for me to, like, say, drink a six pack of completely separate brews than it is for me to run six different analytic softwares on my <laughs> <laughs> So, I think you guys have a hand in that in, in your you know, category of product where you can kind of market multiple things at once. Yeah, we're, we're, I mean, craft beer is still the little guy, and so it's all kind of the little guy trying to kind of get together and, and, and do, you know, do something bigger. So, um, a lot of questions. Greg, do you want to comment before we get into these questions? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we don't collaborate at all. Do you? Uh, all right, we'll take uh, Chris, I guess. Uh, we'll I guess one of the things that, that seems to me is that old world, new world brewers seem to be very, very, very different. I'm excluding the, the big labels, you know, in that and people like that, but it, it seems like in the US there's much more experimentation and willingness to just kind of let it all hang out and go in totally new directions. I know uh, Brian and others have worked with European brewers. How do you see that playing out long term as far as you know, new world new world beers getting into the old world? Because it seems like there isn't much penetration <clears throat> that direction, whereas you know, there's a lot of Belgian and, and, and such in, in the U.S. I mean, yeah, we definitely embrace the, um, the old world, and everything that they're doing, especially at Allagash, I mean, doing Belgian-style beers, we definitely need to embrace that. But I think at the same time, you're right, um, American craft beer 
and not not even just American craft beer, but a lot. I mean, I think there's a lot of European breweries doing the same thing. But there's a lot of innovation right now. Um, maybe like Old World is, you can maybe say maybe like you know, prior to this big boom right here, but this new boom right now, um, very innovative. People are willing to push the limits, and I I think that's a good thing. Actually, if, if you don't mind, can I finish yeah, up ahead, on that? Eric. I think a, a big part of that is. American brewing, other than the big three, didn't really have a lot of history. So we're kind of free to play in the sandbox a little bit. Whereas, you know, in some other countries, you know, you're expected to stick to an existing style somewhat. I don't, I don't think it's, it's fair to say that, any, that there's any country in Europe that there's not a lot of interesting beer coming out of right now and that there's not experimentation. Even someplace that's historically as kind of locked in tradition as Germany, you're still seeing <clears throat> you know, breweries like Fry Guys doing some crazy stuff. So I think it might be a little bit behind because, you know, there was, there was more of a tradition there. Um, but we had a lot more to catch up with because, you know, look at the, the different styles coming out of Belgium. You know, we are still nowhere near, you know, the amount of invented styles in the U.S. that, that, that they've been doing there for hundreds of years. It seems like there's a lot of uh, complexity in, the, in your business in terms of uh, legislation that varies by state. Yeah, that's not uh, I know that there's... <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's, that's not a fun conversation. No, no, but uh, but what, what, what do you guys do to try to uh, get more of a level playing field? And what can we do to try to enable that? Overthrow the government. Probably can overhaul. I mean, what do you guys do to try to get more of a level playing field? We just we just have to play by the rules. I mean, unless we're why will that work? What's that? Why will that work? I mean, unless we're going to overthrow the government. I mean, I mean, it's 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 legislation. It's legislation. It's. I'll take a specific example. So I don't know a lot about it, but it seems in Michigan there's certain laws that prevent the uh, craft breweries from doing their own distribution. That's it's because everybody needs to make a, everybody wants to make a dollar off the the product. The the amount of hands like beer would be really cheap if we could go direct to the consumer. Um, I on the other hand like I envy the alchemists big time because the amount of, that they can sell out out of their brewery like direct and. You know, and they, the well-deserving profits that they make is, is great. Me, on the other hand, it's like I, I have like multiple, multiple tiers of, of taxation, I guess you could call it, because A, I don't own a brewery, so I'm using, I'm using someone else's brewery. Then I, then I go through like a, a national, an importer that does my national distribution, and then every state has its own distribution. So it's like boom, boom, boom. It's like it's, it's taxed on every time, then it hits the retail, or the, then it hits the bar, and it makes, you know, makes for an expensive product. <clears throat> um, in my case, it, you know, it makes me have to make, expand the brand to um, produce more in order to, to make a you know, substantial income, um, because my margins are, are that much lower. So how, so how, how much of that balance how do you balance the passion for craft with the need to make profit? Question that you're not going to be huge, right? Why not? That goal? Uh, that's and my goal. I I don't know. At least me personally, I'm not going to speak for the whole beer commu community as a whole. But just me personally, it's like what. I'm setting out. I you know I set out to do something different. Like you guys had classic today during the lunch break, my canned beer, and that was my like deconstruction of the, the macro lager, but like done Stillwater-esque or whatever. So I'm just trying to like, you know, I want to make something that, you know, I'm, I'm going for a, a different approach where I'm trying to make, make things that don't already exist. So when I do get a market share, there's really no direct competition for what I'm doing. So it's, it's more a secure thing. And I'm doing my best to do it without compromise because um, I don't want to sell out. I mean, I, um, you know, I could probably sell more beer if I like tagged it better, called things, like went more straight ahead with its marketing approach, and you know, said you know this is my IPA, this is my Pilsner, this and that. But 
I'm trying to, you know, I want to challenge people, and as, as, as much as I can get away with, I will do. Um, but I feel like it's something that, like, like we talked about, like the growth of the craft beer industry and like how there's so many new breweries coming up. That, well, m majority of them are creating the same styles of beer that already exist. So my, <clears throat> I guess like what would be more kind of like in line with what you guys do, it's like I'm trying to create my own path in the industry. And, um, and then when, once it's forged, it's, it's like in order to get on, for someone to compete with me and get on that path, they'd have to just, they're, they're copying, you know, and it's, and it's obvious because there's only one, kind of one person kind of doing that. Jim or Josh, do you guys sort of look at it differently in terms of growth and so on? Um, I, 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 like Brian said, I don't want to speak for the whole brewing community, but I know how, you know, to, like you were talking about the balance of profit versus the community and everything. Um, you know, Allagash is privately owned still by one person, Rob Todd, who started the company. When he started, you know, he wanted to start a brewery that was profitable, but make beers that he liked. And, you know, 95 to 2013, we're still doing the same thing. Um, we try to keep the, you know, as much passion and innovation in the product as possible make beers that we like, make sure that they're, you know, qual of quality, very consistent, and then uh, we feel like if we do that, you know, the consumers are getting, you know, smarter, there's more consumers all the time into craft beer, and um, uh, we, we try not to think of it that way, we try to think of it, make a quality product, and then let, let it take care of itself. Jim, your Jim, your job here is to set them straight. Sell you on hops? No, to each his own on what we all drink and what we like. And there is such a spectrum of beers that a ton of people are making, and that when hops, it's popular at the moment because it's huge and it's forward, and people can recognize the flavor profile. It is not the all end all of flavor profile, and it won't crash the future of craft beer. You know, there's room for everybody's palettes on what everybody makes. Uh, we happened to make this beer in a can. We owned a pub um, two years ago that went under in a flood, and we had 10 different beers, and there were three IPAs on, you know. Um, so three IPAs out of 10 beers where you could find sour beers, which are some of my favorites, and um, from exotic to basic to everything. So. It's unfair to just say, let's dominate the world with hops. And from a hop forward company that makes this heady, um, this is a small part of what we can do and what beer can do in general. And um, riding a, uh, I don't think anybody should ride a fad of popularity of what uh, people can understand, but um, it's really easy to, or easier maybe to sell such a profile because it will knock you over the head and a lot of people can get that, you know. Um, but I think that's so wrong in an approach to define yourself by a single profile. Even though hops have infinite profiles of flavor, there are still, um, you know, just a million beers to make. And I'm sorry that hops are popular <laughs> and are dominating. And great, actually, dominating. Greg, I'm curious about from the from the retail side, you know, yeah. I mean, what do you, in terms of choosing what, what the stock, in terms of what people want to buy, I mean, how do you, how do you approach it? Hobby beers are tough anyway because you got to turn them over so quick. I mean, and hobby beers lose a lot of their characters pretty quickly. So that's a tough thing from a retail perspective as far as um, carrying inventory and just in time, sort of inventory of things not sitting at all. Um, but I think part of the hop thing is, is, you know, going back to even Sierra Nevada, which, you know, is, for a lot of people, is their first uh, craft beer that they tried, their pale ale. 
hops are part of the American brewing identity, like if you, you know, American wine is, is you know, big, brash, you know, Zinfandels and, and these high alcohol in your face sort of things. I think it's, it's part of the American thing or, or the American, that, that we're new to the game, so we go big. And then, you know, as people get educated, I think, then, then it becomes part of their, their drinking profile. You know, we see, there's an interesting curve to watch a beginning beer drinker. Um, and, and they start out with, with, with pale ales, and then if they get the hot bug, then they go big, and they just, not enough hops will ever satisfy it. But there, there comes to be a point, and eventually they end up with sour beers, in case you're wondering where that goes. <laughs> uh, and that's where they live. Um, and then eventually they'll come back to just beers with balance. Um, but, but hops are part of that, and you just want bigger and bigger and fresher and fresher. So from a retail perspective, I mean, my... My job is to turn stuff as quickly as I can as far as hoppy beer goes and just to, to get it in and get it out and, and never to allow it to sit because yep. you lose and it doesn't represent the beer that the brewer meant to make. And that's, I consider it a huge part of our job is to always make sure that the beer that gets into a customer's hand is the beer that the brewer wanted them to get. You know, if it's old, it goes out, you know, it, it, it goes back to the, the distributor. If, you know, we refuse a lot of beer that, that's out of code that the distributor tries to, to send to us. I mean, that's our job, is to represent the beer as best as possible. Makes sense. Right here. Uh, so you guys spend a lot of your days actually making and selling beer, but how much time do you, do you appoint someone uh, on your teams to um, talk to customers on the internet? And I'm not talking about beer active forms with the but I'm talking about <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I, I, is that part of your life? Is it hard to kind of come down for a batch and go over and that's definitely not part of my life as a brewer. Um, we get emails, we receive emails, and we send you know responses to those emails. But those, that's not done by a brewer. Um, brewer's life is definitely not there. Uh, <laughs> yes, I can talk for it since I'm the one-man company. And <clears throat> in fact, if anyone knows of an intern that can help me out, I'm actually on on the search. But it's like, yeah, I think it's a, I mean, at least with me, I mean, I'm, I'm a different animal in the beer world. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's taxing. It's like I'm the marketing guy, I'm the conceptualizer, the every, everything. And I, I do think it's important to, I mean, social media is one of the ways that I built my company. And I think it's extremely important. I, I don't understand. Like, I... It will be four years in February, and I even have a uh, bar and restaurant that Ryan and Lee, the beer curators here today, uh, run for me in Baltimore. And I don't think we've we've really pay, paid any money in in advertising. So I think it's like you know because of people like you <laughs> creating creating these social media outlets. Um, it's I, I think it's very re revolutionary for. Uh, a lot of industries, but beer especially, because it's very uh, fastly growing and it's kind of grassroots and, and stuff like that. And it, it allows, um, it's kind of like what MP3s did for the music industry. It's like it allowed you to, to get your product or, or at least to get the idea into people's heads without a huge amount of capital. Well, actually, I think it's worth, Greg, you may talk about the, you know, that the email list and Facebook and so on in terms of what was the, what did you move? It was like 37 minutes it lasted? Not even? Um, I would approximate, if you, if you were asking how much time in my day is spent with, with social media or the, or the internet, I guess, if you include my email list as a whole, probably about 90% of my day. Um, we leverage Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and especially our email list really hard. Um, and what that allowed us to do is we can bring in stuff that would be considered way too esoteric for a lot of other stores. Um, you know, we can bring in six bottles of something and, and you know, with a, with a 2,000 person email list, there's a good chance six people want that bottle in their hand. And it allows us to turn stuff quicker, which is, which is a big deal to me as far as A, freshness goes, B, uh, bringing in interesting stuff. Um, you know, it, it's what's next, what's next. Um, so we, we've, and again, you know, the cost. That, that like Brian was talking about. I mean, uh, advertising is expensive and it's not very targeted. Whereas, you know, anybody who likes us on Facebook, anybody who follows us on Twitter, anybody who's on my email list is at least cursory 
interested in what I have to say, or at least interested in beer as a whole. So there's a good chance when I get something in, and yeah, it's allowed us to turn some stuff kind of bizarrely quickly. Um, you know, Horrifyingly quickly. Horrifyingly quickly sometimes, and sometimes it backfires Ooh. on me, to be honest. And, it, and it's a learning process, because there's really no book for this. Um, you know, you see a lot in the wine world of people using uh, uh, email lists, and, and there's not a lot of uh, knowledge out there that I've been able to find on, on using in the beer world. So it's kind of learning the hard way. For example, there's a, there's a wonderful, one of the best breweries in the world out of, out of Belgium, Cantillon, that, that makes a very hard to get um, sour beer. And when the festival was in town in June, um, we were given a very large allocation of Cantillon. Usually we get three to four cases every couple months. They gave us 22 cases. Um, we thought we were getting a little more. We let our email list know. And at a one bottle limit, 22 cases was gone in eight minutes. Um, <laughs> Now that backfired on me, I mean, and there was some, you know, and I felt bad about the way it was handled and, and I learned from it, but yeah, it does allow you to hit a niche really, really well. Um, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of maintaining it, and, and, but it is, it is, you know, why we are able to get in a lot of the stuff we do and why we're able to sell a lot of the, the crazier beers we do. Cool. All right. <laughs> All right, so we got time for one last question. No, okay, yeah, no, go ahead. I'd like to ask a question of Brian specifically about because you were on one end of the spectrum for maybe maybe in bed or something, but opposite. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot, a lot of people here don't know how the beer business works. Can you explain the difference between what you do and what happens when most people consume most beer in this country that is sourced from someone like Abby Bed? I'm not really I'm not really getting the the direct. I think he's he's asking more about sort of the nature of gypsy versus the nature of if I understand the question. Um, <clears throat> I mean, in all honesty, I mean this. Yeah, but it, it's it's not. I mean, it's not all that that different. I mean, I'm utilizing other facilities to create something. I mean, it started way more grassroots and small than um, maybe a lot of breweries. I mean, I went from just a home brewer to like using a 15 barrel system, but now I just signed a contract in Connecticut to brew on a 100 barrel system. If, you know, it's, if I could produce on a 400 barrel system, I would do it. <laughs> so it's like, it's not all that different. And part of me, like, like releasing a beer like Classique, which is like, you know, it's kind of like a cheeky take on, um, on the idea of just beer in general. Um, I, it's kind of like, I, I kind of wanted to tie it it was kind of like it's kind of like a little joke between the macro and the craft side of things, where it's like, all right, well here's here's a beer made with corn and rice, pills from all all the kind of same ingredients that you would get out of um, a macro beer, but done with the loving touch of a craft brewer. Um, but I I kind of want to I kind of want to just I personally would just like to see the whole beer world change and just go just quality, you know it's it. It, and not and not be separated into craft beer and macro beer. Um, I mean, it's gonna it's gonna take a long time. I mean, there's so much money. I mean, it's massive in, industry involved, and I, and that's why I say you know we talked about like the 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 friendliness within craft brewers because it's like we still we have a common enemy, enemy to it <laughs> to a degree. So it, it, it always brings together friendship. Here's Tim from Oxbow. Fails of running a small brewery. But, um... <laughs> he just delivered a pig, and he smells like hops. <laughs> That's a craft brewer for you. Full on. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think I'm, I think I've definitely, I'm, like, still kind of lost track on your definitive question, but... <laughs> but it, it but, but it's all right. So but I, the, the, the the lady back there had her had her hand up like the whole the whole time. Okay. So I want to give her one more, and then we gotta. He, yeah. I I I'm gonna ask him a downer question because we were talking about parallels between the, the startup brewing industry and the startup tech industry. Um, they're both industries that are really dominated by a lot of white guys. In the tech <laughs> industry, there's a lot of really heated debate about whether this is a really detrimental problem for the industry. Most part. Um, and, and whether... 
there's a lot of white guys in this room. That, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, and that has to do with more like marketing aspects. In all actuality, I've, when I started out, I actually produced my beer with the target to women first. Um, I figure, I've always figured that if you can make a beer that like, women have more sensitive palates, and they, at times like think more about what, what they're doing than, than the dudes. Um, <laughs> I know from experience. <laughs> um, so I, so I always, I feel like I always felt like if you can win over the woman's palate, and it, and you don't market it as a girly kind of thing, like you know, like oh, this is a pink beer and blah blah blah. But if you can make something that's elegant enough that a woman will, will drink, but that a man can will also enjoy. If his girlfriend is like, yeah, I like, I really love cellar door, like you know, I. You know, you should buy more of that. He's gonna drink. He's gonna drink solid oil with his girl. Why not? <laughs> so, um, it's it's kind it kind of the same thing that you get from like nightclubs and stuff like that, where where it's like you get the women in there, and the guys are gonna follow. Um, so it's like whether or not the white male seems to dominate an industry, the women still have the the upper hand. All right. On that note, <laughs> we give our panel a hand.